Isolation diagnosis. So when I say isolation diagnosis, let's first identify the term. What do I mean by isolation diagnosis? Anybody know? Find the area, right? Figure out kind of this is the area I'm working on. But even more than that, using the system itself to help diagnose the system rather than always hopping in with tools. This is something that people get wrong when they listen to my podcast and listen to my ads that are way too long that are under the beginning of every one and all that kind of stuff. They get the idea that I'm like this huge tools nerd. I do like tools and I am a tools nerd, but I actually value the senses more in terms of troubleshooting. And if I walk up to a piece of equipment where the compressor's not running or where the low voltage fuse is blowing or whatever, I'm not going to immediately grab my meter other than to make sure that power's on, power's off, a few things like that to the overall system. But generally speaking, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use my, my senses. Let's go back to some obvious things just to prove if you're a real service technician. I should've done this at the beginning. You walk up to a condenser, okay? It's running. You can hear it running. What is the very first thing you do when you walk up to that condenser? Put your hand over the top. That's right. Okay, so we got. To, oh, you're a service technician. Yeah. yeah. So we got a service technician there. What is the very next thing you do after you do that? You grab the suction line, right? And how cold should the suction line be? Beer can cold. See, there you go. Congratulations. You are all technicians. <laughs> And that's why, like, when I, when I made the Beer Can Cold t-shirts, I don't know if you guys have seen those, you know, it's got it's a hand grabbing the suction line and it says optimal super heat comparison device, you know, holding a can of beer. Some people got mad, like, when I first did that, because I did this early on when I first started doing the podcast and videos, and they, they were like, are you saying that that's how you troubleshoot a system? That's how you set a charge, is by Beer Can Cold. No, that is not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying quite the opposite, but... <laughs> I'll be darned if I still don't do that every time I walk up to a piece of equipment, right? And the problem is, is that, you know, for the guys who taught beer can cold, some of them went, you know, and, and went to other countries where they drink their beer warm, and then they were setting charges all completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> like, you got to think about this stuff, you know? So then you just send them the, you know, the wrapper over the Miller cans where the, where the mountains turn cold, and then they just wrap that around the suction line. You can just tell from a distance. You don't even have to grab it. Are the mountain's blue. You're good to go. I am going to read this because it's got fancy words in it that, uh, I don't know. I isolation diagnosis, making a hypothesis and testing one component or conductor at a time using a process of elimination along the way. We all did this when we were new to some degree. You walk up to a piece of equipment. It's got a lot of wires hanging out of it. Some people just freeze and don't do anything. But if you're like me, you start randomly testing stuff. Just like you just grab a meter and you're just like, all right, let's just start touching it to things and see what I get. You know, like, that's how I did it when I first started. And it's useless because you're not eliminating things as you go. The most overquoted Thomas Edison uh, quote that he probably didn't even say is like most quotes, but you know, the whole, um, when he tried a thousand ways to make a light bulb and they said, you know, you failed a thousand times. And he said, no, I found a thousand things that don't make a light bulb. Uh, and that is isolation troubleshooting. And that's really what it is. It would be ridiculous if he did it and it was like, oh, that didn't work, let's try it again. Oh, that didn't work, let's try it again. Oh, that didn't work, let's try it again. Which is coincidentally exactly what the new technician does with the fuses. Pow, dang it, I got a bad one. Pow, dang it, I got a bad one. Hey boss, I'm out of fuses. <laughs> right, it's not the way to do that. <laughs> we, and we all know that. I mean, even the guy who's doing it knows it, but he just doesn't know what to do other than that. But that's where you have to have a process of elimination. So process of elimination is another way of saying isolation diagnosis, but I mean a very specific thing electrically when I'm talking about this. We'll give what we call the, the redneck compressor test. And I actually, it's written into our internal process sheets at Kalos. I don't share all of those because some of them, if they go outside, people like to judge too much. But when we test a compressor and a technician finds that it is grounded, technician says, this compressor is grounded. Do you know the final test I want them to do? Pull the wires off. Pull the wires off. Isolate those wires, tape them up, whatever. Put them to the side. If it's a plug, it's easy. Pull the plug off, right? Put it to the side. Put the top back on, put the power back on. Because what should happen if the compressor is grounded and only the compressor is grounded? Everything else should run other than the compressor because now the compressor is out of the circuit. 
right? It was blowing the it was blowing the breaker. Now it's not blowing the breaker. That's the redneck compressor test. Easy, right? Before I even go to ohming things out, I'm often going to do that a version of that test. If I do a visual inspection, I go into a condenser. I'm probably telling you guys too much. I'm telling you my secrets. But I go to a condenser. I take off the quarter panel, I look around, I don't see any visual signs of anything. I look down inside the condenser, I don't see any visual signs of anything. Before I even pull that top off and that breaker's tripped, I'm probably gonna go ahead and just isolate all the compressor wires where it's easy to isolate them, put them to the side, turn it back on, now it's working. All right, now I'm gonna go in, take the top off, get in and look at my terminals, make sure it's not terminals, isolate the compressor. I'm not gonna say compressor's bad and run. You know, that's, the, that's not the right way of doing that. I'm gonna go further, but at that point, I've saved myself a few steps. Now you can just as easily do it with an ohm meter and all that, but I learned early on just not to trust. I think I had a bad ohm meter or something where a lot of times it just wouldn't show me that it was shorted when it actually was. There's a lot of people ask why that is. If you've ever done this where you actually test the ground on terminals and it's not giving you, like it's still not showing a grounded condition, just remember that inside that compressor, if the thing is grounded, it's not like a nice little clean thing. It's not, I think in our, sometimes in our, in our minds we imagine, oh, this winding is just, it's, it's bare and it's just sitting there, it's just touching the edge of the compressor, you know, nice and clean. But actually it's this mass of carbon and sh crap and just this big messy environment. So it's very possible that this thing sitting there off after it's shorted and it comes to rest, it's actually not grounded right now but if it moves a quarter inch, it will ground again. Or if you apply a high voltage to it, it will ground again. Anybody here use the Supco Mego meter? The one with the lights on it? Do you know the problem with that tool? I didn't know this when I first got it. Do you know the problem with it? It, it will tell you that a compressor is bad when it is not bad. <laughs> I know. It's amazing. My system sales were higher than they've ever been. The caveat is, is that it's really designed for open, uh, open winding motors. It's not designed for motors that are immersed in oil and refrigerant, specifically scroll compressors. Because scroll compressors, do you know where the motor is on a scroll compressor? It's down at the bottom. Have you ever taken like a big train orange compressor or a Bristol or anything like that, an old recip, and then shook it around? What do you hear? <laughs> Clunk, 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 right? And why is that? Because there's a lot, there's springs in there sitting in suspension, but there's a lot of space. It's like Phil Collins, you know, there's just an empty space. Sorry. <laughs> These things come into my head and if I don't let them out, something dies inside of me. So I apologize, it just happens sometimes. There's, um, no, there's a lot of empty space in there. Even if there is something that's amiss, it's not necessarily going to conduct to the casing in the same way, or even just under normal conditions, because you know what, what a winding is coated in? Have you ever paid attention to that? It's like, a, it's like a lacquer, right? So you have all these windings, they're real close to each other, but it's just got this really thin orange coating on it, right? Just a lacquer. Is that lacquer 100% insulation that no electricity could ever make it through under any circumstance? No, no, it, it will conduct. So when you take a mega meter, and you apply whatever the voltage is, 250 volts or whatever through that mega meter. And that down scroll motor is sitting just that far away from the edge of the shell. A lot of com scroll compressors, especially when they're cold, that you mash that button, that thing will say bad. Literally, that's what it says, bad on it. I took that away from all of my technicians. I was the one who gave it to them and I was like, hey, give that back. <laughs> I, yeah, I appreciate the system sales, but yeah, give that back, right? And that's the reason why I don't love that particular test. Now, what I've done instead is, is they make these pretty inexpensive, I mean, Fluke makes the best ones. The 777, I think is one of them, within that range, 700 range, they're great. But you can also get these pretty cheap ones on Amazon. They even have some that still have the dial on them, but I got the one with the numbers, and it's 30, 40 bucks. You almost never use them. But instead of saying bad, it just gives you a readout. That's much better, because now when you hand that to somebody, now, now you may get the phone call, hey, it's saying, you know, 30 ohms, is that bad? Yeah, that's bad. It's saying one mega ohm, is that bad? No, probably not. It may be that it's, it's you know, the lacquer's getting a little worn down or maybe contaminated oil, which is most likely, um, but that's not necessarily bad on a scroll compressor. In fact, when you read Copeland specs, it will say down to 500 uh, kilo ohms, which is half of a mega ohm is uh, still acceptable, or that's the acceptable range. So that's high voltage and low voltage. I teach the same thing. Isolation diagnosis. It, it's blowing a fuse. It's tripping a breaker on a transformer, the low voltage, the low voltage circuit breaker on a transformer. My first question is, when? Does it do it instantaneously? 
or does it do it during a cooling call? We had one recently. Actually, I didn't have it. It was my service manager was sitting, having to be sitting in my office and one of the techs called him. And you guys have probably already seen, always, already seen this many times. But the thing won't come out of time delay. It goes all the way through time delay, gets to cooling call, and then it just goes straight back in time delay again. Anybody seen that one? What is that? It's a, it's a voltage drop and it restarts it, but why is there a voltage drop? Because there's a short. There's a voltage drop and it's caused by a short. And so the thing restarts time delay every time. But where is the short when that happens? It is usually the contactor coil, it is. But it's in the Y circuit somewhere. How do we know that? Because if it was a short in red, it wouldn't even start going through time delay. If it was a short in green, I guess it could be a short in green, but you could, you know, you put the fan in the on position, blower comes on, right? In this case, we did that. If it was a short in O, well, the O is already energized just when it's put in cool mode. So it's not a short there because it would have blown at that point. So we've already isolated without isolating, without pulling anything apart, we've already isolated. Now, because we have tribal knowledge that teaches us that it's probably the contactor coil, because that's a new thing that all of a sudden started happening. Like, when did that start happening? That didn't used to be a thing. Like, I, I mean, I worked for you know, almost 20 years and we did not have that problem. And all of a sudden, the last three years, contactor coils are just shorted all the place. Anybody else experiencing that? Like, what's up with that? Pressure switch. Yep, that's another one. Chafe pressure switch wires, exactly. That's another one that can be. But the next thing I would do is just go out to the condenser. Again, knowing what we know now, I'd probably just ohm out the contactor coil. But go to the condenser, pull the Y wire off of the condenser. This is isolation diagnosis. Because if I pull the Y wire off of the condenser and then it does go through time delay and it does lock in, what do I know? I know that it ain't the wire, it's not the wire in the air handler, it's not the connections in the air handler, it's not the thermostat, it's something in that condenser, which leaves me to pressure switch wires, contactor. I would probably, before I even knew that, just look down at the pressure switch wires, just make sure that they're not shorted. But that's isolation diagnosis. Observational, isolational. I don't think that's a real word. Did you guys ever see, I didn't put that in here, but I should have put that in here. Did you ever see that picture that I pulled from the um, electrician's handbook in the 1920s? Did anybody, anybody ever see that? I mean, you wanted to talk about a, just a generation of studs back then. I mean, it literally tells you that most men can handle a voltage up to 250 volts without too much discomfort. <laughs> It's not bad enough that it's telling you to nearly electrocute yourself, but then it also questions your manhood if you're not willing to do it. <laughs> you know, it's like most men, like, what is that? This is ridiculous. And then it tells you when you're testing a bell circuit, if you guys have read this, this is not a joke. I've got two copies of these because I needed to have a backup in case somebody got rid of the first one. It says that when you're testing a bell circuit with a very low voltage, you can place it on the tongue in order to test the sensation to see if it's activated. Uh, and if that doesn't work, it tells you to take your shoes off and stand in a puddle of water. I am not joking you. It's crazy. That was before they had, you know, it was before your average electrician had an electrical meter. You know, so they're like, well, what are we gonna do? I guess, you know, take off them socks. Just don't confuse the two. Don't take off your socks and put it on your tongue when it's 250 volts. That's what I'm wondering. I'm wondering about the poor schmuck who died from that. He combined all the techniques into one. <laughs> That is isolation diagnosis. Did he die? Yes, no. Yes, okay. Move on to the next one. It's really, really simple. And once you get this in your mind, then you can create your own versions of isolation diagnosis. Once you know these tools, most of it you could do even if you didn't have a meter. Now, obviously, I'm not saying that you do that because especially if you're working on high voltage, you need to make sure it's off in the first place. So you need to have a meter, right? But a lot of the tests that you do, you confirm, the, you confirm your hypothesis before you move on anyway. Especially when you have cases, like has anybody ever dealt with issues with ghost voltage before? Like where you're measuring voltage, but then like it's not actually doing anything. And in most cases, when we see ghost voltage, it's not usually the case where you're getting induction, inductive gains. It's actually just a really high voltage drop. The easiest way to imagine this is, imagine that you've got an issue with water pressure at your house. And you shut off every faucet and every toilet and everything in the entire house. And then you go to the furthest faucet and you test the water pressure there. Not the flow, just the pressure. Is it gonna be good or bad? Probably gonna be okay, because nothing's moving, nothing's flowing. But then the second that you turn the faucet on and then you measure the pressure, that's when you see the big dive. And that's what we do in a lot of cases where we're like, I got voltage, but then as soon as you try to use that voltage, it goes away. 
right? Because you have volt, you have pressure there because voltage is pressure, right? But as soon as you've got flow, now the pressure disappears. In most cases, when we're you know when we're, when we're running into that, the easiest way to do it is just to try you know a component, use an actual component as your test. So I'm measuring 24 volts here. Let's see if that 24 volts will energize this contactor that I've got at this point. Now let's try it at this point. Now let's try it at that point, right? Now the problem is you could also have a common, could be the issue of what you're losing, and that's actually where it gets tricky. But go ahead and take one of your extra spare wires, wire it up as a common, see if that, you know, so you'd be creative with it. There's a lot of problems you could solve, weird problems, by just thinking isolation diagnosis rather than always like, well, my meter's telling me. You know, that's, that's where a lot of guys go wrong. Another place where a lot of people go wrong in terms of not using isolation diagnosis is they do a form of, um, like, I call it process diagnosis. Process diagnosis looks something like this. Jim Bergman uses this example. He's like, when he first started working with his dad, and they would show up to a furnace that wasn't working, or it wasn't, I don't even know if it was his dad, but when he first showed up to a furnace that wasn't working, what he would do is just rewire the whole furnace. And the reason he would do that is because he knew how to do that. Now, that's a pretty good thing to know how to do. It's very handy, but it's that whole idea of if, you know, the only thing you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. That's a version of that. So it's like when you teach a guy, you teach a good old buddy how to uh, ring out wires. You know what I'm talking about, ring out wires. You go take all the wires, hook them, up, hook them together at one end, you go to the other end and you ohm them out, just see which one's open. Well, that poor fella is gonna do that every time he has any electrical problem whatsoever. Be like, well, I, I, the wires are all good. What do you mean by good exactly? I mean, they all ring out. Well, that doesn't mean they're not shorted. Well, yeah, but they all rang out, so they're good. Heaven forbid you teach a guy how to pull a new stat wire, because then every time he's gonna pull a new stat wire, anytime there's any problem with the system as well, and I'm not joking, I had a guy who would do this to me, and I'd be like, Larry, don't do that. Like, we don't know that it's the wire between the condenser and the air handle. He's like, oh, boss, I was convinced it was. I pulled a new one. You know, it's like, no, don't do that. And that's the problem. That's what, that's what, we, that's what a lot of people do, and all they can think is in terms of a process. An example is, technician goes out, they've been doing maintenances the whole time. And what do you do in maintenance? You clean drains, wash condensers, change filters, right? So they go out, compressor's not running, they clean the drain. Fuse is blown, they wash the condenser. Is it bad to clean drains and wash condensers? No, oh, that's great. Once you get the unit working, you know, <laughs> once you have confirmed the first thing, is one more valuable than the other? Well, not necessarily, but they've gotta be in the right order. So getting really good at your troubleshooting tools, so the stuff we're talking about here, do that first, then find the cause of failure, then optimize system performance. And that is what I call wide narrow wide di diagnosis. Thanks for watching our video. If you enjoyed it and got something out of it, if you wouldn't mind hitting the thumbs up button to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and click the notifications bell to be notified when new videos come out. HVAC School is far more than a YouTube channel. You can find out more by going to hvacrschool.com, which is our website and hub for all of our content, including tech tips, videos, podcasts, and so much more. You can also subscribe to the podcast on any podcast app of your choosing. You can also join our Facebook group if you want to weigh in on the conversation yourself. Thanks again for watching.